Oh, hello. Pleased to be here with you. Um, I am Dr. Uh, Haynes, Scott Haynes, uh, neuro ophthalmologist at uh, VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University. And I am uh, pleased to be talking to you about um, the management of ocular symptoms in PSP. Um, the uh, program directors have been working a long time uh, to put this program together. Uh, they asked me uh, several months ago to uh, discuss on this topic. And uh, typically, um, I see PSP uh, somewhat infrequently. Um, it's not a very common diagnosis, as you're already well aware. And um, in the last couple of months, I have had a uh, much more than the normal volume of, of patients with PSP that have come through my clinic. And so I've been thinking about um, this group and doing this talk today as I've been seeing those patients. And um, there's a, a few things that commonly come up with my PSP patients um, that seem to be almost universal, very uh, frequently come up and uh, have a discussion of, about these different symptoms and, and management of them. And so I wanted to try to, uh, to a certain degree, replicate that conversation uh, with you today um, and also provide uh, some of the, uh, the science behind that. So uh, the uh, issues that we're going to uh, look at today and talk about today include um, eyelids. We're going to talk about ocular surface disease, uh, dry eyes, and uh, blepharospasm, too much blinking. Uh, and these are related and um, uh, sort of interconnected topics. We'll be talking about photophobia, which is light sensitivity. And then that will lead us to a discussion about uh, glasses and uh, specifically uh, prisms. So let's jump in uh, with uh, the ocular surface disease. Um, so uh, PSP is a form of Parkinsonism. Uh, so along with other types of Parkinsonism, uh, patients are well known to have decreased blinking. Um, there is generally a decrease in uh, facial expressions um, altogether. We describe this as masked faces in the medical terminology. And um, as a part of that, uh, patients uh, just blink less than um, they normally would. Um, and so you can easily imagine that uh, decreasing of the blinking is going to lead to um, a dryness of the, of the eyes. Every time you blink, the, the eyelids serve as a, like a squeegee. Uh, they uh, clean and uh, moisten and lubricate the eyes. Um, and so decreased blinking is going to cause some dryness. Um, it also leads to some other sort of complications that sort of cascade and, and make this uh, more and more of a problem. Uh, there's something called meibomian gland dysfunction um, that goes along with that decreased blinking and dryness. And I'll show you the meibomian glands in a moment. And then also a loss of corneal sensitivity. And so this is one of those downward spiral things. Uh, so as the eye is exposed to dryness, it actually does damage to the nerves that sense the, uh, the sensation of the eye, that sense the, the, the dryness of the eye. And so as you lose that corneal sensitivity, then um, there becomes even uh, more of a, um, of a deficit um, to, uh, to the blinking. So all these things come together and create this ocular surface disease. So the cornea, we're going to talk about for just a moment, um, is the, uh, called the window of the eye. Um, this is, um, uh, you know, actually uh, somewhat uh, underappreciated. You know, it's more than just a window, actually. Um, we tend to uh, think of the lens, which is an internal structure in the eye, as doing the focusing of the eye. Um, and that is true, but to a much greater extent, the cornea, uh, does the focusing for you. So the cornea is responsible for about 75% of your focusing power um, to, uh, to, to focus on your, on your uh, target. And um, the way that the cornea is organized, it's really fascinating, right? Like um, if, you've, if you've thought about this, the, the cornea is alive. It is made out of tissue and, and cells, and yet it is um, totally transparent. 
And so the design there uh, comes about because that tissue is just very highly organized um, and that creates the uh, transparency. The cornea is also unique uh, because uh, the cornea and the lens of the eye are the only tissues that I'm aware of that do not have blood supply. And that makes sense, they cannot because that would create a problem. Um, blood is not transparent and it would, it, you would uh, impair your vision. So how does the cornea survive if it doesn't have any blood flow? Well, the cornea relies entirely on the tear film to receive the, uh, the nutrients and the things that it needs for its metabolism. And so you can see why this discussion of dryness in the tear film becomes really important um, uh, for, for vision and for the function of the cornea. And so dryness, uh, because of this, uh, creates uh, some disruption of the normal functions of those cells and uh, it actually creates uh, damage. So the picture that I've shown here is uh, from the uh, AAO, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, just showing a very severely dry eye and showing what the cornea looks like. They've stained it with a fluorescent green marker. So basically everywhere that there's an irregularity on the cornea, you see a bright green spot. And so you can see that this cornea is sort of pockmarked and cratered and, and divoted. And uh, you can easily sort of imagine why this eye would not see clearly. Um, it loses that uh, highly organized, um, uh, or the uh, tissue um, uh, makeup. And so let's talk about the tear film a little bit. We, we just think of tears as pretty simple, right? Just watery stuff in the eye. And I don't want to get like it's too complicated, but it is more complicated than that. So there's actually three important layers to the tear film, and they come from different places. So on the very uh, inner surface uh, of the tear film, the adjacent to the eye, the eyeball itself uh, secretes a sort of a mucousy layer. Uh, mucus is uh, helpful for... Um, the tear film, it, it's uh, a surfactant. That means it sort of spreads out the tear film uh, evenly across the eye. And then there is the watery layer, which is, um, which is secreted by what we call the, the tear glands, the lacrimal glands. Um, and that's the, the, the biggest component in terms of volume. Uh, but then on top of that, there's one more layer. There's a lipid layer, an oily layer. And uh, that oily layer comes from the meibomian glands that I mentioned earlier. And this is, in my opinion, the most important of the layers. They're, they're obviously all important, but um, the oily layer serves as a uh, sort of a evaporative barrier. It kind of seals in all the other layers. It's, uh, it floats to the top. And so these oils come out of the eyelids, and these glands um, uh, come right out of the, the, the sort of tip, the edge of the eyelid. And so every time you blink, uh, they're supposed to secrete a little bit of oil and uh, keep that oily layer healthy. And so if there's reduced blinking and all the other things that we've talked about, there's gonna be potentially some dysfunction here. And these, uh, in this picture here that I am showing on the right side, you can see um, the meibomian glands are very uh, sort of clogged up and inflamed uh, from um, some of the dryness that creates uh, some disruption. And they, if they're clogged, then obviously they're not uh, gonna be able to to perform their normal function. Uh, so these are all uh, common issues that uh, just arise from not blinking as frequently as um, maybe you used to. And so, well, what can we do about this? Well, one thing is um, uh, that I sort of start with recommending, it's called lid hygiene. And uh, no, this doesn't mean you don't have good hygiene, but it is an extra step that patients can take to take really good care of their eyes and uh, improve the ocular surface. And so a lot of this is focused on uh, improving those meibomian glands, getting those oils um, flowing and, uh, and functioning. Um, and so uh, lid scrubs, and this is uh, very simple to do. You can buy a solution of this, or you can just make a solution with a, a cup of warm water and a couple drops of baby shampoo just get enough sudsy to scrub with. And then you just wash your eyelids where, where the eyelashes come out of the eyelid, uh, wash that. Um, and then uh, use a hot compress, get a wash rag nice and hot, just enough that, uh, not too much that it'll 
that it, you can tolerate it, it'll burn you, but uh, otherwise uh, a nice hot rag and um, let it uh, cool down over the eye. And that is that heat is going to get those oil glands. Um, so the scrub opens the pores and then the heat gets the oils kind of melted and flowing uh, better so that you can make the most out of the blinks that you, you still do have. Um, and of course it would be great if you could just blink yourself out of this by consciously thinking of it, but uh, blinking is far too much of an automatic thing to rely on, on, on being able to increase your own blinking. And then I would always sort of add to the lid um, scrubs and compresses and to say artificial tears. Um, artificial tears have a little bit more of a sticking power. They're just a little uh, slightly thicker than the natural tears and um, they can uh, supplement uh, the, the, the natural tears. Um, you can use up to four times a day with regular artificial tears, but if you want to use it more than that, that's, that's actually fine. Uh, just get the preservative free type. These are all available over the counter and that should be um, essentially unlimited as far as how much you can use that. Um, and so um, I think at this point I ought to qualify everything that I, I'm saying here just to point out that I am a uh, neurologist practicing neuro-ophthalmology uh, and not an optometrist or uh, even an ophthalmologist. And so uh, uh, I talk to my patients with the PSP and, and advise them on these things and um, discuss this, but more sort of in theory than in actual practice, I do rely on my ophthalmology colleagues to, um, to treat some of these uh, different things with um, some of the more advanced uh, treatments. And then the uh, same thing with glasses that we'll be talking about uh, soon. So anyway, there are more advanced treatments for dry eyes. Um, and this might include ointments. So this is particularly useful at nighttime. Uh, really goopy stuff, but if you're going to be um, sleeping and not looking at anything anyway, um, ointment at nighttime uh, can really give the eye uh, some good hydration. Um, there are ocular inserts. Uh, this material actually goes into the, um, into the eye and just sort of slowly dissolves over time and uh, supplements the tear film. Punctal plugs, uh, the, this is sort of the drain of the tear. So if you uh, plug up the drain, then it helps to build up more tears. And there are prescription eye drops. These are typically anti-inflammatory type of uh, medication. And um, they, uh, they work on a lot of it is sort of the inflammation associated with the dryness, particularly those meibomian glands. Reducing the inflammation there um, can help them to function better. And then you get into things that are quite... Uh, atypical, but for very advanced cases, there's some options. Uh, autologous serum drops. These are, these are eye drops that are actually made out of your own blood. Um, you donate your own blood and then it gets turned into uh, to eye drops. Uh, that is because it comes from your own tissue, very um, uh, sort of easy on your immune system. And then there is a scleral contact lens. This is a very large contact lens that fits over the entire cornea, covers the whole thing. Uh, and simply essentially creates like a uh, vapor chamber to keep the eye uh, moistened. So there are some pretty advanced things that can be done in cases of dry eye. Now I think dry eye in and of itself is worth treating uh, because of the significance of what it does to the vision. But there's definitely one other really important um, symptom or condition in PSP that is worthy of, of treating dry eyes to address this or prevent this from happening. I'm going to talk about blepharospasm. Blepharospasm is an abnormal uh, increase of blinking. And so some people will develop a situation where they develop uncontrolled blinking. Um, and there's a spectrum of what it might do. Some people just blink a lot. Some people uh, feel comfortable just to keep their eyes closed and just hold their eyes closed a lot. And some people have uncontrolled closure of their eyes and uh, really cannot open their eyes unless if maybe they, they actually pry it open, holding it open with their, with their uh, fingers. Uh, and so that uh, occurs um, because of uh, the, uh, the dryness in, in, in patients with PSP. Um, so they described it as they say, a two-hit hypothesis of where blepharospasm comes from. Uh, so, so one of these things is a susceptible brain. And so PSP definitely fits into this category. Anything that um, predisposes somebody to having a movement disorder 
uh, is felt to probably be related to imbalances in, in dopamine. Um, and so PSP is a, is a form of Parkinsonism and it fits that um, criteria. And so everybody, you know, interested in, in PSP and talking about this is sort of already in that, that category. Um, and then the dryness is the other risk factor. It's considered an environmental trigger. Um, so if an eye is dry and it's chronically dry, dry a lot all the time, then um, the brain is getting a signal that it should be blinking. And that chronic exposure to the brain of the need for more blinking and the uh, propensity to movement disorder uh, sort of creates some sort of a, we don't really understand, but some sort of a, a, a situation where the, the reflex sort of switches and becomes overactive um, and becomes dominant and the patients will be um, sort of uncontrollably blinking. And so um, it is uh, in part treatable or in part avoidable uh, by treating the dry eye to begin with. Um, if it does occur, it can also be uh, treated by uh, use of Botox, um, uh, botulinum toxin uh, injections that can uh, weaken the, uh, the overactive muscles and help to decrease uh, too much blinking. And so um, patients who have uh, both dryness and blepharospasm and uh, otherwise just uh, patients with PSP often do describe uh, increased sensitivity to light uh, and that's photophobia. Um, so this is uh, common in many neurologic disorders. There's been a ton of research on photophobia and um, common things like migraine. Uh, but it, uh, it, it definitely applies to patients with PSP. So in one study, uh, a survey type study, uh, they found that 43% of PSP patients uh, self-describe as having photophobia. And uh, it comes on uh, fairly early on, the average uh, is in the first two years of uh, symptom onset. And so um, we've worked out a little bit of the uh, pathways uh, for this as to why uh, photophobia occurs and it is um, uh, it's interesting and a, a little bit complicated um, so there are pathways uh, in the brain that um, mediate the light sensitivity that actually don't necessarily have anything to do with vision and so the eye um, has pathways that connect back to the thalamus and from there the visual information uh, goes back to the occipital lobe and this is the back part of the brain where um, you know the sensation of vision actually occurs. And because you see brightness, um, that contributes to some of the photophobia. But you notice that there are uh, a few other branches off of this pathway that go in just different directions, um, including uh, directly to the, the uh, somatosensory cortex and also including the trigeminal uh, ganglion. And so um, what is... Uh, uh, essentially going on is that there is a, a sensitivity here that is independent of vision. Um, and this doesn't apply to PSP, but it, it helps you understand. I have patients who have actually lost their vision. Um, they would be considered blind. Um, and yet because some of the other pathways, so that they may have lost the, the visual pathway, but those other pathways are still intact and they actually experience photophobia. So although they cannot perceive sight, they still have um, sensitivity to uh, too much light and brightness. It's sort of the, the worst of both worlds um, in, in that setting. And so um, we do understand uh, some of the uh, players in this pathway. Um, and to, to really sort of uh, understand the treatment, I think we need to talk about a melanopsin containing intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell. And so if you're familiar with retinal physiology at all, uh, you may know about rods and cones. These are the cells in the retina that detect light. Um, rods are responsible for detecting uh, sort of faint light and peripheral vision. Cones are responsible for um, more uh, fine vision and colors and things like that. And those have been known for a very, very long time. 
Um, it was about 20 years ago that there was discovered to be actually a third type of light sensing cell in the eye that was rather completely different from these others. And this is the melanopsin containing intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell. That's a mouthful, but I don't know of any other name, but maybe we can just call it the melanopsin cells. And um, what was worked out, and this is you know sort of fascinating, is that these are the cells that seem to be um, uh, subservient to the non-visual aspects of light detection, right? So we always think that the eye is, is important for seeing, and of course that's important, that's, that's the main function, but there are some things that the brain does with light that is not visual. And um, so maybe a good example is uh, control of the pupils, right? So if you shine a light, your pupils are gonna get smaller, and that is independent of whether you actually see the light or not. There's a different pathway to control the pupil size. And another excellent example is uh, keeping track of circadian rhythms. So your brain needs to be able to track uh, day and night cycles to properly train the brain for your circadian rhythm. And um, that all occurs uh, independent of, um, of, of necessarily having uh, vision in the, uh, from the occipital lobe. And so those are some examples. But of course, what we're interested in now is understanding the trigeminal outflow, that pathway that I showed you, um, uh, which creates photophobia or light sensitivity. So this is a, one of those separate pathways, and it's primarily um, under the control of this, this particular cell type, the melanopsin-containing cells. So understanding these cells is going to help us to, um, to treat this. And so these cells, we have uh, found out, are most strongly triggered by a certain wavelength of light, uh, anywhere from 480 to 500 nanometers. And so I put a spectrum on the, on the slide here so you can see uh, where that fits in. That's right around the blue to blue-green region of light. So that is going to be um, the best way to stimulate uh, these uh, non-visual neurologic functions Okay, or in the case of where we don't want to stimulate it, like with a tr with a photophobia, um, preventing that is going to be um, the best strategy. And so, what do we do? So, you know, if you look into this, you're going to find a ton of options of what uh, can be done for um, tinted lenses and ways of um, sort of mediating that. In general, tinted lenses are effective for controlling light sensitivity, right? They're tinted, so they decrease your uh, sensitivity. Um, but they are what I call a two-edged sword because uh, they also make you more sensitive. And anybody who spent um, time in the dark, I mean, everybody knows what I'm talking about. If you get up in the morning after it's been dark and turn on the lights, because you've been in the dark, you're very sensitive. And so um, using dark glasses can can similarly make your retina become more sensitive than it would be with it. So you don't have the glasses, you're worse off than you would have been otherwise. And so I uh, recommended my patients FL41 lenses um, as sort of a compromise. And this is fascinating because this was worked out before we worked out the details of the melanopsin ganglion cells. You know, they just tried a whole bunch of different formulations and formula 41 was the one that seemed to work the best. And then after we learned about these melanopsin cells and how they work, um, it sort of really clicked and made sense. So what I, the, uh, the glasses of FL41 look like, um, this in the bottom left corner here. And what this does to the, to the spectrum is you see a rather big notch in the uh, sort of blue-green range of the spectrum. So it transmits most of the light but it does block sort of the most pain sensitive uh, type uh, component of the light. And so I consider this a compromise. We're going to block some of the light, but not really block all of the light. If we take this graph of what FL41 looks like and compare it to maybe just a regular pair of gray sunglasses, you'll see that there's actually a real benefit here. Um, some of the, the gray glasses actually have a little bit of a peak right in the area of interest where we want to block the light and FL41 uh, is the, the most effective in, in, that, um, in that region. And so um, this can be a great option for you if um, light sensitivity is, is a big issue. Now, this is purely symptomatic. It's not like um, there's any harm to not using it, but um, it can really be a, a good option for those who need it. 
Um, and so we're talking about glasses. Let me just pause for one moment and say that, you know, we've got a lot of different kind of glasses to talk about. So we're talking about tinted lenses. We're going to talk about bifocals. We're going to talk about prisms next. And I, and I do want to be careful um, to um, just point out that um, don't, don't need to have too many pairs of glasses. So you want to pick the symptoms that really seem to, to bother you and focus on that. Otherwise, we can get easily carried away in getting uh, far too many pairs of glasses. So um, in terms of uh, bifocals, the, um, the thing to know about with bifocals is that um, progressive bifocals are probably the worst. And then um, regular bifocals would be sort of a, a little bit of a compromise somewhere in between. Um, anybody who has used progressive bifocals, these are the no line bifocals, um, knows that when you first get them, it takes some time to get used to them. It takes some, it's a bit of a, of a confusion sort of getting used to that. And um, if you have PSP, this, this is a condition defined by a difficulty in moving the eyes, particularly vertically up and down, which is exactly what you need to do to make those glasses work, to get your eyes exactly into the sweet spot to make them work. And so avoiding progressive lenses is what I recommend. Uh, bifocals is maybe a bit of a compromise, like the classic traditional two-section bifocals. But um, even better would just be to have single vision glasses, something for near, something for distance, maybe even a third pair for intermediate um, distance. And then the last thing I wanted to, to address was prisms. Um, to discuss the different kinds of prisms. There are uh, two kinds, and um, I have sort of different feeling about each of them. For uh, those who have trouble looking down, this is like one of the classic features of a supranuclear palsy, is difficulty looking down. They make yoked vertical prisms. These are prisms, yoked means they're pointed in the same direction. And um, it simply helps to point the eyes of the vision downward and helps with a very task specific uh, function. So I do recommend these if you have an issue with this. And so for example, looking down to eat, if that's problematic, they make prism glasses that can sort of point the vision downward and uh, facilitate that. And then if um, it's, it, the, the one thing to be aware of is that if it points your vision downward, then you will lose your straight ahead vision. That, that's probably intuitive, but um, worth, worth mentioning because you wouldn't want to wear these all the time. But if there's a very sort of specific task where you need to look downward for a while and you can't otherwise, um, putting these glasses on might be beneficial. And then um, the other type of prisms uh, are horizontal prisms. And there may be a place for these, but I have a little bit less or a little more hesitation in recommending horizontal prisms because they're so challenging and frustrating. So this uh, is to treat a problem called convergence or divergence insufficiency. What this is, is um, a, a difficulty with looking at objects up close or far away. So if I look at an um, object up close, I have to follow my finger in closer and closer and closer. My eyes sort of come together to uh, look at the target. And then when I look back at a distance, my eyes spread apart again. That is um, a classic convergence. And uh, some people with PSP will have trouble with both convergence, moving the eyes inward, and divergence, moving the eyes back out again. Um, if you do not have this uh, situation, you can sort of simulate this. If you just look at a distant object and hold a finger up in front of you, without looking at it, you know, you'll see a double image. But of course, if you focus on it, then you can see it single again. But in PSP, it may be trouble looking at it, that focusing up close may be the problem. And so um, that's a convergence insufficiency. And so prisms theoretically could fix that problem. Um, but the challenge with um, the situation here is that it's actually quite a bit different whether I'm looking at something 12 inches away or 15 inches away or, you know, 24 inches away, the amount of convergence is, is entirely different. And so finding a single pair of glasses that, that accommodates everything is, is unlikely. Not to mention the fact that PSP is a 
neurodegenerative condition. Um, it is progressive and, and, and basically there's fluctuations. You're going to have good days and bad days and the strength of the prisms may be imperfect on, on certain days. So my basic takeaway for that would be if you have a slight problem with uh, horizontal double vision with this convergence issue, that horizontal prisms may really be, you know, effective in treating that. But if it's a very significant uh, situation, it may be more frustrating than beneficial. And um, in that case, you can always control double vision by just covering over one eye. Um, and so by whatever means, if you put a pair of I put a glasses on and put a patch over that or a cover or a slip or a clip on or anything like that. You can always just cover one eye and create a single image and um, prisms may be more frustrating. So I would say if it's a problem, give it a try, but I wouldn't recommend doing it on a, um, you know, multiple attempts. If, if it seems to be frustrating and it's not working out, then it, it may not be um, a good option for you. So those are my prepared comments and we can uh, move on to the uh, question uh, section. So much that information was wonderful for our audience and we do have several questions that have come in. Um, one person said that um, you explained that dry eyes result in surface damages. Do you, you need to prevent it with regular drops before it starts to feel dry? Yeah, I, I do think in PSP that that may be um, worth doing. Now, it's a, always a spectrum, and so you have to kind of look at where you are on the spectrum. And um, <laughs> it's not something that you will ever be able to, as a patient, ever be able to observe yourself. Because if you look in the mirror and try to count how much you blink, you're going to blink uh, very regularly. Because if you're thinking about it, you obviously still have your conscious control over it. And so you almost need somebody to sort of um, uh, surreptitiously to pay attention to what your blinking looks like and um, maybe even count your blinking and see um, where you're at with, with that. Um, even then, that would be a bit of a judgment call. And so I, I do think that um, because of the risk of blepharospasm in PSP, um, it's a, you know, almost half of patients, um, sorry, that was the photophobia, but it's, it's a common um, a symptom in, in, in PSP that getting out ahead of the dryness, and, and we're just talking about over-the-counter artificial tears as sort of like the first line, I think that's probably worth doing. Okay, great. Thank you for that explanation. Um, we had another person who asked, any insight on what to do about continually watery eyes. Uh, drops haven't had much help and one surgeon recommended surgery to block the ducts but they're leery of the side effects of the procedure. Okay so uh, this sounds counterintuitive but I think you got the idea that, that watery eyes is actually a symptom of dry eyes um, and uh, the, the reason is that once the eyes become dry so they start to start it out dry that there is that neurologic signal um, to overcome that or to, you know, to, to water. And then unfortunately these natural tears, they just, um, they kind of run and, um, do not, uh, persist and keep the, um, the eye, uh, uh moistened, I guess, as, as much as it should. Um, and so anyway, um, I showed uh, one slide with some of the more advanced, uh, treatment options and punctal plugs is exactly, um, what what they're talking about. Um, I actually don't think there's much of a huge downside to getting the punctal plugs and giving it a try. Um, they're not like they're high risk. If we're just talking about plugs, and I would recommend getting plugs first. There is um, some, I guess the downside to plugs is that they sort of fall out sometimes. So you might wake up in the morning and find the plug on your pillow and then you are um, basically have to go back to the eye doctor to get it placed in again. And that, that can get frustrating. But um, punctal plugs uh, are, are fairly safe. I don't think there's really any reason not to do it. In patients who really like punctal plugs, but they're kind of annoying because they fall out, you can actually have the punctum cauterized. And that may be what you're actually talking about in the question 
um, because that's more supposedly a permanent um, uh, change. They burn the, uh, the, the punctum to, uh, to keep it sealed or closed. Um, and so I'm not sure when to advise that particularly. I, I, I tend to just think of the plugs because they're, they are so benign. Um, but if you have a really good track record with plugs and you decide that you want to go forward with that, it, that is one of the options. But I would, I would just say try plugs, which can always be removed uh, first. Thank you. Um, one person would like to know, are prism glasses effective when walking? If so, which type of prism glasses? Okay, so I would ask, the first question I would ask is, what is the, um, what is the, uh, the, the problem that they are experiencing? Remember, there are two problems. Uh, there's the down gaze palsy, uh, which I would assume is what we're talking about because we're talking about walking, uh, or there's the double vision from the divergence abnormality. And so if we're talking about walking, um, I, I don't know. I, I don't think that they're really that practical. Of course, when you're walking, you need to look down so you can see your feet, right? But don't forget, you still need to look straight ahead. Um, I have a pair of these glasses that are um, sometimes used in, in the same situation for the prism glasses. These are um, actually mirrors, um, but they are uh, sort of uh, marketed as prism glasses and um, first of all they do look funny um, but um, what I experience when I put these on they've got the prisms on their their mirrors to, to bend the light so they can look downward and I'm looking at my lap right now I'm looking at my keyboard and my hands down below and so it's great for something that I need to look downward but you can imagine the challenge that I can't look straight ahead anymore. And so walking would, would be limited for that reason. Thank you. Um, someone else says that they have severe problems with their eyes and they have apraxia of the eyelids. Botox injections have been helpful, but is there anything else they can try? Yeah. Apraxia of eyelid opening is particularly tough symptom. Um, it is um, I call it the, uh, the flip side of blepharospasm. So for every um, muscular contraction in the body, there is always a um, corresponding relaxation. Okay. And so I'm going to give you a really simple example that, that you're familiar with, right? So we got a, a bicep and um, if I flex my bicep or contract my bicep, then at the same time, my brain is going to send a signal to relax the triceps to give um, the biceps maximum function. And so if we take that same principle and we put it to the eyes, then there is a muscle to close the eyes. And then there's also a muscle to open the eyes. And so with blepharospasm, you have increased activity of the orbicularis oculi, the eye closing muscles. Um, but with apraxia of eyelid opening, it is, it's essentially the same neurologic issue where you have overactivity of this neurologic pathway. But instead of it being the, the closing muscle, it's the relaxing of the opening muscle, the levator palpebrae. And so um, it's essentially a, still a movement disorder. It still is considered a, um, a, a type of dystonia. Um, but it's almost like the uh, the flip side of the coin. It's like a relaxation of the eye openers. And because of that, there's not... So Botox is helpful to reduce any of the eye closing that might be part of that. But there's not really a medication that does the opposite of Botox that could be given to the eye opening muscles. And so it is actually pretty limited. Um, Many people do have what's called a sensory trick. So if they can touch someplace on their face, and it doesn't have to, sometimes it can hold the eyelid open. It doesn't have to necessarily be that though. Sometimes just touching something on the face. Uh, sometimes it's even talking, chewing, singing, humming. There's some other activity of the face seems to distract this abnormal reflex and um, can help to open the eyes. But short of that, there's really nothing to do except to use something to hold the eyelid open. 
and uh, you can tape the eyelid open. You can have glasses made that have, it's called a crutch that props the eyelid open. Just do be careful with those. Um, we talk so much about dryness. If you're taping your eyelids open or if you're crutch to pop them open, you know, dryness is definitely going to be an issue. So you want to um, be very aware of that and never, you know, sort of be in a situation you might take a nap or something, fall asleep with your eyes taped open. Um, you know, you could really, really um, do some damage there. Thank you. And I think we have time for just one more question. And this person wrote in through registration saying that my patient has PSP and CBS. His speech therapist is training him to use AAC augmentative and alternative communication device. There have been a few times that he could clearly see the pictures on the device for now they're teaching him on his laptop. And then a few moments later, he couldn't see that same picture at all. What this and what are um, some options to treat this issue? <laughs> That's a tough one. I'm not sure if I know exactly what the problem might be. Um, in there's sort of multiple. Um, this this particular patient has multiple uh, issues that is outside of just typical uh, PSP. So it may not be worth going into great detail with the whole group. But um, my guess with PSP is that it is uh, some problem with uh, controlling the eye movements. Um, that is uh, going to be difficulty to use um, a device that requires uh, certain eye movements. I, I'm actually not sure that I've ever seen anybody try that combination before. And, um, you know, it, it it's a, always worth a try, but it may not be a, a great success um, to be able to use a, a device that requires uh, certain eye movements in a condition that is known to cause limited eye movements. Okay, and um, we have about a minute left, so I'm going to take this time to thank you so, so much for being with us for this conference. We're so grateful to have you and all of your wisdom um, for our patients and their caregivers and families. And to our viewers that are watching today, we have uh, Dr. Haynes's slides available down on the resources section of our website. So if you want to scroll down a little bit, those are available there. Um, should you happen to open a new window and close this one, don't worry. Just hit the back button. Come right back to us. So stay tuned. Our next session is going to be with our friends. Um, that would be that Stephanie Ross and Hayden Smith. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Haynes, for Great. being Thanks with for having me.